we, as an organization, the St. Petersburg Arts Alliance is devoted to making sure that artists in our community um, are cared for and embraced in every single way. So this workshop is part of that. And this workshop is, is to make sure that we address uh, concerns, issues, questions involving healthcare, which is so important. Um, and we got the top of the top to help you. Um, so the workshop is being moderated by our board member, Joseph Papich. You, there he is up there, he's waving, he's not waving, now he's waving. Um, he is an employee benefits advisor and he works with Wallace Welch and Willingham and he's a benefits negotiator, he's a for forecaster, he's a communicator of company cultures, which is interesting. Uh, an employee advocate, an HR partner, and uh, a very enthusiastic St. Petersburg uh, art lover and on our board, we'd love that. Um, so Joseph is gonna moderate the workshop uh, and Joseph has vast experience and the workshop will be led by Peter Motzenbecker. Peter, you wanna? Way. There he is. He's an independent health insurance and Medicare uh, professional. So you really don't have anybody better than these two gentlemen who care about our community and who have the expertise and the history to be able to lead this workshop. So with that, I'm going to scoot because this is shine week and I've got a bunch of things to do. Um, but I wish you the best. And I hope you all enjoy the workshop. And um, I, and by the way, lastly, Tracy Kennard, our communications and marketing director, she's gonna be our tech person. She's recording this and so other people could see it as well. So thanks to Peter and Joseph and Tracy and bye-bye. Thank you, Terry. So there's some fantastic introductions. I hope we can live up to them today. Um, and I just wanna say, you know, this is, uh, online uh, seminar slash dialogue. It continues the conversations that the Arts Alliance has with the com creative community, the impact you artists have on our local economy. And we look to support you to thrive here in St. Pete. Uh, open conversations like this, they take place in many forms at the Arts Alliance, including advocacy, like last week's mayoral forum, classes through our arts business academy, and the job opportunities that we post right on our website, Calls to Artists. So I'd like to point you to those. But today, our goal is to um, have that conversation about health insurance. With that in mind and our technology at hand, we want to be sure we all cover what is important to you. So please help us by letting us know you're able to use the chat, check in with us, or perhaps type in the number one question you had on your mind about health insurance today. Certainly something might have hit a chord with you to get you to join us today. So if you put that question into the chat, we'll make sure that we touch on it um, and you can be on mute, you can be off mute. Certainly if you're, if you're live, if your mic is hot, we ask you know, that there's no background noises, but certainly if Peter gets to a topic that you wanna hear about and you wanna have a conversation on, please come off mute. Um, if he hits your topic that you put into the chat, come off mute, have that conversation with him. Just keep in mind, this is an open forum, lots of ears here. This isn't a personal health consultation, right? Um, try and keep your private information private, but certainly we're gonna talk about processes, cost, why healthcare exists. Maybe we'll ponder the philosoph philosophical background of healthcare, I don't know. <laughs> um, but these are the uh, ideas that we can speak on today. So um, with that said, I'd like Peter to help get us started. And my first 
question to Peter would be, you know, tell us about a little bit about what you do and why now is the time of year that we're having this health care insurance conversation. Joseph, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Peter Matson Becker, and I am an independent health insurance and Medicare agent here in St. Petersburg. I work, uh, my agency is nationwide. Technically, we work everywhere. I don't necessarily work everywhere. I don't need to. There's plenty of people here in Florida who need help, but occasionally I work in other states. Uh, we do work with over 200 carriers nationwide. There are nowhere near that many carriers in Florida, but as an independent agent, it doesn't matter to me what solution works best for you. It absolutely, well, it doesn't, I said that wrong. The only thing that matters is what solution works best for you, not what carrier or what particular solution it may be. So I, I want you to know that and you may have never thought about this. There was a time in my life when I hadn't thought about it. I am not a captive agent working for a company. And there are great captive agents who work for great companies like Florida Blue and Aetna and Cigna and Humana and United Healthcare and on and on. And they are terrific, terrific companies and terrific agents, but they work for one company. So um, an independent agent just has the luxury of not working with one company. So that's what I do. I do it every day. Uh, a, a, a lot of under 65 health insurance, a lot of Medicare, some supplemental business, whether it's accidents or cancer or critical illness policies. But uh, today we are specifically here to talk about uh, a very timely issue, which is the open enrollment for the Affordable Care Act, which you may better know as Obamacare. Okay. And that open enrollment is beginning and it begins every year on November 1st. It normally only runs till December 15th, but it has been expanded this year to run until January 15th. So what is, well, let's, let's step back and say, you know, what is the ACA? The Affordable Care Act is uh, a federal program that provides health insurance for Americans who otherwise don't have Uh, many of us, and I suspect many on this call, either currently have or at one point had insurance through an employer. And you left that job, lost that job, became an independent contractor, pursued your, you know, your, your profession as an artist, which means you're a sole practitioner, I guess you could say, um, and you don't have health insurance. Or maybe you have health insurance through a spouse or significant other. All of those are possible scenarios today. So every year there is an open enrollment in which people who do not have health insurance for whatever reason are able to enroll in a plan that will have an effective date of January 1st. Okay, so this year is a little unusual because it runs from November 1st until January 15th. But in previous years, you would have from November 1st until December 15th to enroll in a plan that would then go in effect on January 1st, okay? Now we can, we can and we will uh, perhaps talk a little bit more about what those plans look like, but they're health insurance plans. They cover pre-existing conditions, which is critically important to some people because outside of the ACA, you can be declined by a health insurance provider. Um, and of course, that's a pretty scary thing if you need health insurance and someone tells you you're not insurable. Uh, it covers things like uh, preventative care, whether that be annual physicals, um, you know, uh, uh, colonoscopies or other regular periodic uh, medical appointments that would fall under uh, that type of care. Um, and that's, that's where I'll start. I, I, uh, Joseph, I, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe I missed something there, but that's where I'll start in terms that of what's was, happening now. <laughs> that was good. Um, let's actually, I think the number one question I always got on health insurance is, what is a pre-existing condition? You mentioned that it coverage would start so you, immediately. Yeah. yeah, so so let's talk about pre-existing conditions for a moment. Um, 
So someone may come to me and they say, I don't have health insurance. I need health insurance. I lost my job. I quit my job. My spouse retired and now I don't have health insurance. One of the things I need to know is if they have any pre-existing medical conditions that limit our options. What is a pre-existing condition? It could be something terrible like cancer. Um, it could be diabetes. It could be something as simple, but not unserious as uncontrolled high blood pressure. Um, believe it or not, it could be something like you have a torn rotator cuff and you've been meaning to get that taken care of, but you haven't bothered with it because you don't have health insurance. There are carriers that will find out that you have a torn rotator cuff. And the way they find out is they'll say, do you have any conditions for which you have been recommended surgery and, with, and that surgery has not been performed for any reason? Well, you have two choices if you get asked that question. One is to tell the truth, which is, the, which is what you should do, because if you don't tell the truth and they find out later that it was a pre-existing condition, they're not going to cover it. Um, so imagine, and many of us you know, have either have a pre-existing condition or one of our children who needs to be insured has a pre-existing condition. And, uh, and we may not be able to look at certain kinds of health insurance. That is one of the great things about the ACA. The ACA will never, can never, by federal law, decline you for any pre-existing condition. So those people need the ACA. Good, good, excellent. Um, on continuous that thought, um, I think this is a little bit different than the order that we talked about before. This is a great segue. Susan had asked about MRIs and if they're preventive care. So could you touch on what essential benefits are and then that includes preventive care, what's preventative and not. Yeah, well, you know what, if, if I, and I apologize because what okay. I really would like to do is pull up a list. Okay. And Joseph, you may, and I won't, but I'm not going to because I don't want to sit here fidgeting and looking for lists. <laughs> uh, and, you, and Joseph, given your background, you, you, you can probably tag team this with me. But anything that you might think of as a reasonable and expected covered type of benefit, like your annual physical, that periodic, you know, every 10 years or whatever it is, you have to go get a colonoscopy, um, blood work, things like that, that are routine, you can expect to be covered. It may depend on the carrier, but what you will find in non-ACA policies, non-affordable care act, private health insurance policies, which are great policies, they cover nothing. There is, no, there is nothing that's considered preventative care. Oh, I mean, they, they recognize it as preventative care, but you're gonna pay for it. You're gonna pay for it. It may, be, it may be credited to your deductible, but it is not automatically covered where under the ACA, all manner of routine, periodic benefits are covered. Joseph, did that by any chance give you a chance to? That, that was great. Um, I, I certainly can't remember all 10 of them, but emergency room coverage, maternity uh, is included in that, prescription drugs, uh, laboratory services, as, as Peter was talking about. And then in addition to that, preventive services, and that's one of the 10 essential benefits. I put the link uh, to healthcare.gov's yeah. website for that in the chat. Preventive services then additionally would mean that you have no pre-existing condition for the item in which you're getting seen for. So what I like to use as a description of is I go in for an annual physical, or if you go in as for an annual well woman exam, that is by definition, my annual physical well woman exam, it's a preventive visit and it's covered 100% by the plan, which is great. But, <laughs> There is a specific code that the doctor puts in for the claim for that preventive service. It also includes childhood immunizations, um, other tests as we get older and milestones in our life, such as the age of 50, right? Um, you might have a colonoscopy, that kind of thing. If the code is put in differently than preventive code, then there would be a charge for that generally. Doctors are aware of this and they really want to do what's best 
for your expectations and meet you there. What I would say is if you're in an annual physical and you also have <laughs> uh, a knee problem, just be aware that once you start you know, going in for the knee as part of that annual physical, you might be changing the, the service code. And that also applies to any lab or MRIs as well. Generally, I can't imagine a reason why an MRI may be preventive, but it may be. Um, what I would say is that if you do not have a pre-existing condition for a uh, high cholesterol, then, and you go in for your blood panel as part of your annual physical, my expectation then would be that that would be part of the preventive benefits, you know. Um, but you get diagnosed with high cholesterol, the expectation then would be is that future labs may be at your cost if you're using ACA coverage. And, and, and Joseph, you know, you pointed out uh, a, a couple of things and, and thank you for doing that. Yeah. Um, maternity. So let's just take maternity as one example that obviously is very important to some people seeking health insurance. Non-ACA plans generally don't cover it. So if someone came to me and they were planning a family, um, they would very much want to look at an ACA plan because, and, and, and by the way, I am speaking to Florida specifically at the moment. Um, Florida does not have a lot of great non-ACA options. They really don't. You have to be a specific kind of consumer, very healthy, primarily looking for kind of catastrophic coverage before I would point you in the direction of a non-ACA plan. And, and, and to a certain extent, maybe financial consideration. Um, but, you know, mental health, generally not covered outside the ACA. Uh, pediatric, not covered outside the ACA. So there, it is important that you understand what your needs are, what your family needs are when looking at any kind of health insurance plan. Um, and, and I do want to say this while it's top of mind. So we're talking about the annual open enrollment period. And there are people who make the mistake of not having health insurance and finding out they have to wait until next year to get it. So I told you that the open enrollment period is until January 15th this year. I will get a phone call sometime after January 15th from someone who needs health insurance and they will not be able to look at the ACA because they do not have a qualifying event until next November. And then their plan won't go into effect until January. There are alternatives, but it becomes a lot more difficult for some people. So what I wanted to make mention of is there are special enrollment periods. Uh, you could lose a job, you, are, you could move, you could become pregnant. Um, Joseph, I know there's a handful of others. Yeah. You move, yeah. you have a baby, you lose your coverage. Um, that is considered a special enrollment period and you have 60 days from that event to enroll in an ACA plan. Yeah, yeah, that's excellent. So we do have a couple of people that have mentioned yeah. those special events already. Yeah. So um, Laura was telling us, um, by the way, Laura, not to single you out, but congratulations for taking that leap. And I, oh, hi. Look, uh, from um, employee, to business owner, right? And and taking that that chance on, on developing your craft and, and your business uh, in the arts. Um, so Laura is transitioning from business insurance to individual. Um, and do you have any questions about if you qualify for a special enrollment now or when would you be looking? Well, that is a good question. Yeah, I, I was wondering, because I voluntarily left my place of employment, it's not as if I was let go or fired. I, I willfully left my position and therefore forfeited my benefits. Would I still qualify for that 60-day special enrollment period? Yes, because they're not going to ask you whether it was voluntary. You just have to be able to show that you lost creditable coverage in the last 60 days. And if it's okay, does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. So I'm gonna answer a few questions. Now that I opened up the chat box, I'm gonna answer a, the questions. I don't know if any of these are private questions, so I'm just gonna answer them without mentioning the name. 
But great first question I see is uh, related to Florida blue. There are, and I'm not, I, let's see if I can do it from memory. In my opinion, there is only, well, up until 2022, there was only one carrier in the Florida space that I recommend, and it is Florida Blue. I, I want to say no offense to these other carriers, but they would probably take offense. There's a company called Ambetter. Most of you have probably never heard of them. There's a company called Bright Health. Some of you may have heard of Bright Health, but they do not have a great network in this area. I think they're up and coming and one day they'll be a, 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 a real good carrier. But right here, right now, I do not have opportunities to recommend them. There's a company called Oscar. You've probably never heard of them. There's a company called Molina that you've probably never heard of. And I might be forgetting one, but I promise you, you've never heard of them. So 10 times out of 10, I recommend Florida Blue. Now we have great news. Two new carriers are joining the ACA marketplace in Florida, effective January. So they, they will be available to review starting in November, Aetna and United Healthcare. So I don't know that either Aetna or United Healthcare will beat Florida Blue, but if you came to me and asked me to help you look at plan options, there will be three viable options in my opinion, Aetna, Florida Blue and United Healthcare. So that's just great news for everybody. And we'll see if it, if it, if it makes for a competitive um, you know, marketplace, it should help. So I hope that, yes. Is that outside of the exchange or that, or, are you talking that's about- That's inside the exchange. And, okay, thank you, sorry. Now United Healthcare does have plans outside the ACA, but those are the plans that don't always work for everybody, okay? Um, so Peter, if I could ask just based on what you touched on right there, what would somebody be comparing if they're comparing Florida Blue, United and Aetna? What are they looking at when they're comparing their plans? Uh, well, they're, they, they, by law, they're gonna have very similar coverages. And of course, they're gonna have to cover the 10 essential benefits. You're primarily gonna be looking at price and network. So this is the way, this is the way I would work with anyone. This is the way I do work with people. So I would ask someone, where do you live? So let's assume they live in St. Petersburg. I would ask them, who are your doctors? What prescription drugs do you take? And that would sort the carriers for me. So we might find that Florida Blue has the best network for you and Aetna has a terrible network for you, or we might find something completely different. What we're trying to do is find the plan that gives you the most flexibility. If all three of them are equal, then it's gonna be price. And unless you say to me, I had a really bad experience with United Healthcare, I don't wanna have, I don't even wanna look at them. Um, you know, we would pick the one that provided the best options for you. Okay, Joseph, Excellent. does that answer that? Excellent, thank you for that. Appreciate that. It becomes difficult, I know, to compare, to feel like you're ready to compare insurance coverages without the experience that I know Peter has. So um, that, that's a great high level breakdown of what, what you're looking at with them. So sure. the, next, the next question I see, yep. uh, you know, we're on our last month or two of corporate health insurance and we'll be switching to the ACA. And by the way, let me, let me share this with you. You don't, need some, you don't need someone like me to look at ACA plans. You can go to healthcare.gov and do it all on your own. You, do, you won't pay more or less for doing it yourself. And I talked to plenty of people who said, I, I signed on to the healthcare.gov site, created an account. I've looked at all the plans. This is what I think I want. Great, you're all set, you don't need me. Um, I may just be able to help confirm what you're looking at if, if you want me to. But what I will tell you about getting off corporate health insurance is I talked to someone, maybe it was last week, who thinks they, who thinks their paycheck is debited, you know, whatever you want to call it, $40 per pay period for health insurance. They are going to have a terrible, terrible, you know, 
rude awakening, if you will, if they have to go on the ACA. I don't, I don't know anything about any of you, but you know, a, uh, a 40 year old who enrolls in uh, the ACA, who doesn't qualify for a tax credit is probably, probably going to pay, you know, at least four or $500 for, for a high deductible plan, at least, at least. And it could be, it could be, you know, a meaningfully more than that. And that's just me kind of winging it. Now, if you qualify for a tax credit, it might cost you nothing, or it might cost you $150 per month. Um, so it depends on how many of you are there, you know, your ages, of course. And, I, and I'd be very, very glad I could do it in about 60 seconds if you, if you want me to. Um, but, you know, I can give you answers to questions like that very, very quickly. Okay? Okay. Uh, now, I'm going to go ahead and answer the next question since I hear, see it here. Make sure I'm not missing anything. Is retiring... A qualifying event, you better believe it is. Uh, because when you retire, well, well, hold on. Yes, that, that's actually a loaded question because you could retire at age 60, right? You could retire at age 50. Uh, and if you're losing insurance, it would be a qualifying event. If you're losing group insurance, it would be a qualifying event. If you're turning 65, you're going to enroll in Medicare. But yes, if you're retiring at 54, that is not a qualifying event unless when they ask the question, are you losing creditable coverage? You can say, yes, I'm leaving my corporate job where I had health insurance. They're gonna say, who is it with? You're going to say it was United Healthcare's PPO plan. And that's gonna be the end of that. And you do qualify for a special event. Excellent, thank you. Um, any more questions from those who are attending? We really, really want to get your questions out first. Make sure everybody has an understanding of what's coming up. Well, you know what I will. You know what I will go ahead and and, and mention. Um, I'm going to ask you not to hold me to these numbers because I don't know if these are 2022 numbers, but I mentioned tax credits, and, and many of you probably might not even know what I'm talking about. So I told you that an individual might pay several hundred dollars a month for a Florida blue plan. Um, let's, let's say they're 50 years old. They might pay four or five, six hundred dollars a month. But if their income falls into certain limits, they could get a significant tax credit. They could get a four hundred dollar a month tax credit that would reduce their health insurance to one hundred and fifty dollars per month. These are rough numbers, but. 51 for a single person below 51, well, 51,000 and below would qualify you for some kind of tax credit. If it's two people, it's just under 70. If it's a family of three, so you have a child, it's just under 87,000. A family of four, 104,000. But that's real easy for me to look at for you. Basically, what I do is I, all the other information be the same. You know, it's Myself and my husband, he, um, 47, he's 48. We make you know, $65,000 and I plug those numbers in and I'll tell you what kind of a tax credit you get. Some people don't pay for health insurance and they've got the exact same health insurance as the person who pays $1,000. Thanks, Peter. <clears throat> how does the tax credit work? How does that function in, in how you pay? and? Yep. Yep. So, so here would be, here it is in a real, you know, in a real example. Um, let's say that I asked you all of these questions. We're looking at different plans. We've decided, decided Florida blue is the right plan for you. And of course, Florida blue has 20, 30, who knows how many plans they have, but we find the right plan for you. And we determine what your income is for the size of your household. And let's say you qualify for a $400 a month tax credit. That is reduced off of your monthly premium. So if the plan was normally going to cost $800 for your family of two or three, it's going to cost $400. At the end of the tax year, 
and actually technically next April, when you do your taxes, your, your, your income better be what you thought it was going to be, or you may end up owing money back. So if you, and it happens, you or your spouse get a high paying job halfway through the year and you don't tell the marketplace and the marketplace was expecting you to report 60,000 in income and instead you report 160, you're going to owe all that money back. So you're going to owe hypothetically, you know, $4,800 in taxes back because you did not provide an accurate number when you um, made application. Now, it works the other way too. If you didn't realize you were going to be eligible for a tax credit and you're paying 800 a month, when you go to file your taxes, one of the questions in your tax return or your CPA will make sure you provide it is, did you have health insurance? How much did it cost? Oh, you, you should have qualified or you do qualify for a tax credit. You're going to get back $4,800 in taxes. So it can work either way for better or worse. Thanks for that. Must be um, kind of hard people going ch through changes to accurately project that. For the and year. you can notify that. You, you, totally true. You can notify the marketplace as soon as you have a change. So, you know, imagine this. Imagine you're a realtor. But, and, and, and this is, I don't have to imagine it. I know real stuff. but they don't make any money. They don't make any money until they sell a condo on Beach Drive, you know, and then they make, you know, $60,000 or whatever they get paid for a big commission. Um, yeah, you can, you can have a hard time. You could sell a big piece of art, right? And of course, you know, of course, and I, and I don't say this um, lightly, when you own your own business, you can sometimes control how your income is reported, right? Because um, you can write things off and, you know, a lot of this does involve conversations with your accountant or a financial advisor to make sure that you're not realizing income that you could have avoided, um, you know, into, a into another year. Thank you, thank you. Are there additional penalties uh, above and beyond having to pay the subsidy back if you have uh, misjudged your, your income at the beginning of the year? Uh, Joseph, I'm, I'm going to say not that I'm aware of, and I, okay. and I hope I, 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 I just <laughs> I don't know if they add a penalty on. I'm not aware of a penalty, um, but they're going to make you pay it back. And, and I see um, I see another question here. Yeah, there's three questions on right. that one. Uh, and let me know if I miss any. Yes, the tax credits are already available. So now they may change. The tax credits may change for 2022. They changed last year. Uh, the Biden administration expanded them dramatically, dramatically, making it much more affordable for a, a lot wider range of people. Uh, you know, it's almost, it, it, it almost sounds crazy, but you know, there are, it, you know, couples making over $100,000 that qualify for tax credit. Um, it depends on their age. So somewhere age factors into that. I don't know how the formula works. I can only plug in the numbers, but my experience tells me that a 60 year old couple gets a bigger tax credit than a 30 year old couple. That's what my experience seems to show me. I just don't know the formula. Um, and the next credit question I see um, elaborating on the qualifying factors, it is based on, I, I kind of just said that, didn't I? Uh, it is number, the two. here's the two questions they ask you. How many members are in your household? And what is your household income? And yes, uh, you are pigeonholed. And I will tell you, if you don't make enough income, you don't qualify. So, you know, I, I, and the lower limit, I want to say it's around 12,000 for an individual and it's probably close to double that for a couple, but sometimes it's a problem if you don't make enough money. And I've had people who were like, well, let's assume I can get to the minimum. Um, Cause they're going to want you to fall in a bracket on the low end. It's a, maybe as low as 12, 13,000 up to some upper limit. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Thanks for that, Peter. Yeah, appreciate that. So uh, if I could go over to uh, another question is what are the aspects of an insurance policy in the form of deductibles, co-pays? What are all those yep. terminology? Things? Yeah, and that, that came up as a, in a pre-question, a pre if you will, right before we started our formal conversation. Yeah. So and this is true with all health insurance plans. All, all health insurance, well, all health insurance plans have premiums, right? They're gonna cost you something whatever it is at work, you know, if you have group insurance, you may be paying $40 every pay period or something crazy like that. Where on the ACA, you may be spending $1,000 a month. A family of four might be spending 2,000 or more per month. That is their premium. And the plan they are in will have co-pays and deductibles, usually. The co-pays are what you pay when you go to the doctor or go to a specialist or go for lab work or go to the hospital, okay? And they're all, and they're gonna vary. They're gonna vary by plan. They're gonna vary by specialists. They're gonna vary by whether it's a, um, an emergency or a planned hospital visit. And almost any number you could make up could apply to a particular plan. But, you know, you're gonna go to your regular doctor. I'll, I'll use myself as an example. So I have a Florida blue plan. When I go to the doctor, I pay, I don't pay a copay. I go straight to deductible. So some plans don't have copays at all. You just go straight to your deductible. If, if I had a plan with a copay, my copay might be $40 for a primary care visit or $20. It might be $60 for a specialist. If you do not have copays and you go straight to your deductible, that could be $5,000. 8,000, it's, if it's a family, it could be even higher. Then you go to the doctor and you pay the negotiated rate for a primary care visit. So I don't even know what it is, but when I go to my primary care physician, I know they tell me, okay, your copay is whatever they tell me. I don't know if it's $80 or $60 or what, or $40, I, I don't remember, but I just hand them my credit card. They give me a receipt, which I don't even keep because I know, Florida Blues keeping track of it. So if you're in a low deductible plan, then you may be responsible for the first $2,000 of expenses every year. And you're going to hit that deductible by co-pays or an ER visit. You know, let's say, let's say you have a, let's say you have a $2,000 uh, deductible. And every time you go to the doctor, it's $50. Well, if you go to the doctor 10 times this year, that's $500 out of your pocket. You still are responsible for the next $1,500 towards your deductible. If you go to the ER and you end up with a $1,500 bill, you just met your deductible for the year and you're going to pay nothing else for the rest of the year. Okay? You hit your deductible. Now, there are high deductible plans and I'm on a high deductible plan. My, my family deductible is $17,100. Individual deductible is $85.50. So if my wife, hypothetically, if my wife or I, or our youngest son who's on the plan, um, have a bad year, we could get to $85.50 individually. If another member of the family has a bad year, we could get to $17,100. Uh, that's a, that would not be a good year, would it? But our son had multiple ER visits two years ago, and we came within striking distance of our, and we have an older son who's in college now. Um, we came in within striking distance of our family deductible. That's, that's an unpleasant experience. But if you, and people do say this all the time, well, why would I want a high deductible plan? You know, why would I pay as much as I pay for a plan with a $17,000 deductible? Well, it's because those hospital bills for my son ran in the $50,000, $60,000 range, maybe higher. So that's why you have insurance. You have it for the catastrophic events. 
Now, could I be on a low deductible plan? Yes. I could get on a plan with a 2,000, 4,000 deductible, meaning any one of us could hit 2,000, but the family could not pay more than 4,000 in a year. That sounds like a pretty good deal, right? I mean, comparatively, wouldn't you rather have a $2,000 deductible than an $8,500 deductible? Well, what if I told you that plan would cost $4,000 per month? Why would you pay $48,000 a year because you didn't want a $17,000 deductible? So I, I, I know at least one of our participants you know, is expressing their dismay with this, which I agree, uh, I 100% agree. Healthcare in this country is not in a great state. It's really not. And uh, it doesn't even matter if you work in the business like I do. You know, you're going to pay one way or another. But what you've got to make sure is that, you know, we're living in terrible times, right? If anyone on this call doesn't have health insurance and you get COVID and you end up a long hauler or you just end up in the hospital for two months with a big chunk of it in ICU, you could have medical bills that you'll be dealing with for the rest of your life, right? So no matter who we are or how healthy we think we are, any one of us potentially could face something catastrophic like that. Thank you. <clears throat> so the plan that you're on, that would be pretty much as catastrophic coverage as it, as it gets, the numbers you threw out. You can't, you, yeah, you can't have, on the ACA, that's the highest deductible you can have. Okay, all right. All right. So that's uh, maybe a starting point. Um, I think we are all caught up on the chat. I'm gonna ask a personal question yeah. uh, for my mom, because every year I hear her complain about Medicare uh, and the, the costs that she has yeah. um, for, for her prescription drugs. Um, so I don't know if anybody else is near in the age of 65 or has a parent themselves. What, what changes can we expect for Medicare in the new year? Well, well, there, there, there are Medicare changes every year, but they're generally not good because they primarily involve rising costs. Uh, and prescription drugs are particularly a problem that Congress, you know, tells us they're going to address eventually. Um, but prescription drug costs can be significant um, for some people. And in particular, medical advances have made some drugs like cancer drugs, prescription drugs. So it used to be that the only way you could get treatment for cancer was you had to go into a facility, right? You were either in the hospital or some kind of outpatient facility receiving something, some kind of treatment. Well, now they can send you home with a prescription that costs thousands of dollars per month. And you know, even in a best case scenario, you end up responsible for some portion of that. I think it's way too complicated to get into here, but I, what, what I will address here with respect to your, your mom or any, anyone who's on Medicare, is when you're ready to enroll in Medicare, you have some really important decisions to make about whether I hesitate to go here so we can just drop it once, once it gets confusing. But every one of us is eventually going to enroll in Medicare. For some of us, it will be at age 65. For some of us who have great health insurance or a spouse you know, with great health insurance, we may de delay enrolling in Medicare. But for simplicity's sake, let's just say that at age 65, you enroll in Medicare. You're gonna enroll in Medicare Part A, which is free if you've worked for 10 years or your spouse or significant other has worked for 10 years. You are going to enroll in Part B. Part A is hospital care. Part B is outpatient care. But Part B is going to cost you at least $148.50 a month, which is pretty reasonable compared to everything else we're talking about. The problem is, is that it doesn't cover everything. It only covers about 80%. So you have to either buy a Medicare supplement to supplement what's not covered by Medicare, or you have to get a Medicare Advantage plan. And those can involve additional costs. And making that decision, and by the way, uh, Joseph, prescription drug plans. Whether you have a, a standalone prescription drug plan or you have a Medicare Advantage plan that includes prescription drugs, um, you know, you're going to have prescription drug costs. And the more drugs you take, the more you're going to spend. 
up to certain limits, but it can get it can get up there. Okay. All right. Um, good. Thank you. I don't know if there's any other questions on Medicare or anybody getting close to that. I think Peter can answer those questions as well. We had just one more question that came in at the chat too. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it was asked about uh, who qualifies to be on the same plan together, basically. Right. Um, can it be domestic partnership or does it have yeah. to be marriage? Yes, domestic partnership, perfectly fine. Uh, the tax credit then too, um, does that work on tax uh, household income? Uh, yeah, they're going to get you one way or the other because they're, they are going to ask, you know, they're going to ask what the household income is. Um, so it's a, let's just use this example, um, a household of two and what is the household income? Now they are going to look at taxable income. They are going to look, they're going to verify this by way of your um, tax return. So, you know, if one of the two doesn't work, you're still a household of two and your estimated income is going to be $60,000. And that's what they will use to calculate. Thanks for that. Um, okay. I think that we are um, open up here. Peter, did you have anything else that you wanted to cover? That uh, no, I think what I might do is just, um, you know, recap that for anyone on this call that thinks they might need to look at health insurance, um, the open enrollment period runs from November 1st until January 15th. Uh, the funny thing about that extension is normally I would say, and the effective date is January 1st, but obviously since they've expanded it to January 15th, if for some reason you don't enroll in a plan until January 15th, I presume then your plan would go into effect February 1st. Um, but anyway, the important thing is, is that's a big window and if you need health insurance, that would be the way to do it. You can do it on your own at healthcare.gov. You can call someone like me and I can run the numbers for you uh, or some combination of the two. You could ask me to confirm that what you think you are looking at makes sense. I'll tell you what I think. I can see all of the plans. So I can tell you if the plan you're looking at is really the best plan for you based on what you've shared with me. Thank you for that. I'm sure Peter um, can uh, extend his personal information through the chat with anybody if you want to direct message him. <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and just type it in right now. Oh, cool. Thank you very much. Oop, I didn't mean to hit enter. <laughs> it, it, it does that to me uh, all the time. I, I meant to hit return. Enter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, return, not enter. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Well, Peter does that. Uh, just wanted to make mention, you know, um, as the umbrella organization for the arts in St. Pete, um, we continuously seek for ways to greet artists at the intersection where your craft meets your business and well-being. And I encourage everyone who's in the attendance today to stay connected with us on stpeteartslions.org and our social media pages as Terry Marks and Tracy Kennard and the St. Pete Arts Alliance team will continue to lead these conversations and we'll soon have more to share on these topics. Thank you very much for everyone attending. I wish you well with your business and your health. Any final words, Peter? Uh, I have a house with a decent amount of uh, local artist artwork in it. So I thought I'd Thank just put it in there. I, I attend the Main Sale Art Festival every year too. So I've got, I've got some art from there as well as downtown, you know, galleries and things. So anyway, I love art. Awesome. Me too. I had to, didn't want to call anybody out you know put anybody ah. in prime position here so I, I ended up taking it down <laughs> for this anyway that that's great peter thank you okay. very all much. right thank you thank you thank you all. thanks okay. everyone bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.